should work. It's your composite. So you put a lot of hands up for Idema there. Hands up if you've heard of composite. Yep, tumbleweed through the, uh, through the audience. So Cognizant is huge, actually. We have 200,000 employees, 12 billion in revenue, 2 billion in revenue here in Europe, and a little bit of revenue here in Denmark. So we actually have an office here in Denmark, we have an office in Norway, we have an office in Sweden, so we have the, the Nordics covered. But our uh, Nordic operation I believe is one of the most innovative in the world. And what generally happens in the Nordics tends to happen in Europe and then happens in the US. So in many ways, I think in Denmark, you're at, right at the forefront of design, at the forefront of technology. So one of the issues I have with my bosses is to sort of say, well, you know what, that's a really great idea, but have you seen what's happening in the Nordics? around technology and business. So like I say, my job is to run a, a center for the future of work. So my job is to look five, six, seven years out and figure out what it all means. And I have to say, I think it really is an era of great head scratching. No one really knows what's going to happen. So my prime minister, whether he will be in office in three weeks time, no one knows. I'm Scottish, I don't know if I'll be part of Britain in a year's time, no one knows. And I'm pretty sure this guy here, I think is, uh, you call him Pillow, I call him Casper from Borgen. But he was really surprised when she won the Eurovision. And you could actually tell she was gonna win the Eurovision by looking at the way social media was trending. So there's some really, really interesting things happening in our society, society today, things happening in our business today. So what I want to do is tell you the story in three parts. I want to give you a flavor, really, of what smart products mean to business and what smart products mean to you. Because I'm being kind to some people, but I think the average age in the room is about 27. And I suspect you're going to see some really, really big changes in the way products are designed, the way products are used, and the way economies actually work. So I've tried to tell this story in three main ways to sort of give you the catalyst of what's happening, to give you the effect of what it's meaning, and then to give you some action points that you can begin to, to think about at least, when thinking about what smart products actually means from a business perspective. So, the digital imperative. Well, I would argue we really are entering into brand new territory. In fact, we're right in the middle of brand new territory. There's some huge, huge changes happening in the way our societies work, the way businesses are run. And what I would like to suggest to you is it's based on technology. It's based on what we call the smack stack. So, social, mobile, analytics, and cloud. These technologies <coughs> taken together really are bringing consumer technology into the world of business, into the world of design, into the world of crowdsourcing, co-creation, this is what these technologies are doing. So we call it the smack stack. It's like an integrated technology that's like a, a force on processes, on the way we do things, on everything really. And what it's actually doing is creating what we call these um, halos or these data fields of information. So I don't know if that translates for you, um, a halo. Does anyone know what a halo is? What it's associated with, an angel? You know, it's like a religious, religious thing. But what we wanted to do at Cognizant is to try and describe what digital really means. And it's about understanding a person's halo or information that sits around them. So more and more companies are competing on code the data and information that sits around a person, that sits around a product, 
that sits around a customer. That is what the world of Code Halos really means. So to bring that to life, that's a very old photo for me, but I want to give you an example of what my data says about me and what organizations can do with that data. So what I do online, what I listen to on Spotify, what I like watching on TV, what I search for on Google, what I do on LinkedIn, the way I do my banking, it all says something really, really unique about me as a person and what I like to do. So when these companies look at us, when Spotify looks at me, or when LinkedIn looks at me, it sees something really unusual. So that's, that is what I'm about, actually. I love uh, The Killing, it's one of my favourite shows from Denmark, uh, three, four years ago. Um, but what do you think LinkedIn, what do you think LinkedIn sees when it looks at my data? Well, LinkedIn sees the fact that I used to work at Forrester, I used to work at IDC, I speak <laughs> Spanish, and I generally change my job every three to four years. LinkedIn has an algorithm that understands me and starts feeding information to me based on my likes, my preferences, and what other people tell LinkedIn I'm good at. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so LinkedIn sort of, um, that's, that's really put me off, but it's going to make me laugh. Not in a bad way, but it's quite fun. Uh, so if you think about LinkedIn and what LinkedIn does, LinkedIn sees the fact that I'm good with numbers, I speak Spanish, I'm good with research, and I change my job every three to four years. LinkedIn's algorithm is understanding who I am and what I do. What would happen if this could talk? Imagine if this had a data field around it. I have a son who's um, nine years old, and getting him to brush his teeth really is the devil's work. It really is so hard. I would love to be able to look at his data from his toothbrush and understand what he's doing, how often he's brushing his teeth, what angle he's holding the toothbrush at. Now imagine if I could give that data, the toothbrush data, to the dentist. And every time my son Oliver goes to the dentist, the dentist dials up his data and says, you know what, Oliver, you're not holding the toothbrush the right way. Your bristles are wearing out from the brush. You're not vigorous enough, and you need to do them more than once every two days. <laughs> that is the power from what a smart product can do. And if you start thinking about how that data can be used, not just by the toothbrush company, but by the dentist, by the parent. Then you start understanding how products and their data could be more valuable than the physical product itself. So that toothbrush is almost getting rich with meaning, rich with data, and it's how well, as a business, you can use that data and make meaning from the data and make money from the data that really counts. So, beautiful design follows beautiful products. So think about the toothbrush that can connect with the smart mirror and diagnose the issues with your teeth. This is actually live, this is actually happening. Philips have developed a smart toothbrush and they're starting to design with <coughs> agencies a whole load of beautiful products that work with it. I would pay a premium for this mirror just so I can get my son's brushes teeth properly. So, any noun, any person, any place, or anything has a virtual self as well as a physical self. This is what smart products are about. This is what these new technologies are about. So products are getting at a virtual identities. Products are getting smart. And I want to give you an example of what this actually looks like. Because um, I don't know if there are any keen tennis players in the audience, are there? Does anyone play tennis? 
one person, two people to play tennis. Well, I really, really, really want one of these. Those players are going to up their game. So when you go out and play, and you turn on your racket and record data, when you get off the court, you can transmit that data to your smartphone, computer, you can see what you did on course. It's called level up play, and it comes with sensors in the handle that measure things like where you hit on the screen bed, how much power, how much spin. Through the face of the racket, the company has recruited top 10 player Rafael Nadal. Right. Who wants one? So, my tennis game is awful, but if I could somehow track how well I play tennis, how well I spin the ball, how hard I hit the ball, where I'm hitting the ball in the racket, think about what I would pay for that service. Think about the app I would like to have on my phone that could track how well I play tennis. Very simple solution. Beautiful design, a really nicely written app. So it's about the software, it's about the technology, it's about the user experience, about the customer experience, which comes through blending the physical to the virtual. So that for me is a really, really interesting idea, really, or, or uh, how should I say, a possibility of what beautiful design and smart products could actually mean. So, when you look at this and think about as products get smart, what they mean to the businesses that we work in and how we actually use them, I wanted to test and understand well, what does it mean? How can I actually look at this in terms of um, a market shift? So, I'm very lucky, I was able to uh, secure some money from Proposon to investigate. So I actually went to The Economist. I don't know if you've heard of The Economist here in um, Denmark, but they're pretty global. So I asked them to, to survey, not just technology people, I wanted them to survey designers. I wanted them to survey product design executives, innovation executives, R&D executives, CEOs. I wanted, them to under, I wanted to understand how are they looking at this opportunity? And the results, I think, are, are really, really fascinating. So I got about 100 from Europe, 100 from the US, a very, very different approach to what smart products means, depending on whether you're in Europe, it's more about collaboration, whereas in the US, it's more about killing each other and killing the competition. So the Europeans are very collaborative and want to share data and participate on co-designing. The Americans want to, uh, you know, kind of control or kill the competition and beat the competition with smart products. But I want to give you a, a bit of a, a, an insight to, to what the data said. And I, rather than just um, give you tables and charts and you know, this is this X percentage, this is X percentage, what I want to do is try and give you a framework really for what this world is going to look like. It's my job to provide our customers with, with frameworks to sort of say, yeah, 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 I understand digital, but what does it mean to me this year, next year, five years? And that's what I've tried to do with smart products because I think there's three phases you're going to see. This is till about 2018, this is to about 2020, <coughs> and this is about 2025. So from about 10 years from now, you'll see this happen. But what I would argue is right now, you're seeing this focus on alchemy. So alchemy is an old fashioned word where you convert it, you know, lead into gold. And what I'm, what I'm saying with this is I think more and more products are going to get smart and create value because of the data that they generate. Now, as time goes on, it's going to be about how well you can analyze data and share data and push data to different parts of the business. So you make meaning from data. That's really where the value is going to come from. And then finally, you're going to see this era of consortia. So you can think about this in terms of um, the connected car. Have you heard about the connected car? You know, how these different you know, suppliers are coming together and making their products really smart and they're starting to connect together. 
So, I don't know if you know, but BMW actually put a, uh, a sensor in their car that feeds data to insurance companies. So insurance companies can dynamically price insurance based on how well you drive the car. That's very scary for me, very scary for my son and my daughter, but if I want 30% off my insurance, I would probably put the sensor in my car so my data feeds to an insurance company. That is what the consortium is about. The same with the home. You've heard of connected home, how the thermostats are getting smart in our homes, you know, how they're starting to link with other providers around, you know, burger alarms and insurance companies from insurance and so on. The connected life, you know, it's all starting to marry up. It's all starting to connect together. And it's all around beautiful experiences, beautiful products and data. This world is about data. So if we look at phase one, product alchemy, well, I could read you through this, but basically, it's not that difficult to make products smart. You're gonna learn about it today. It's not difficult to do. But what it does do is create all sorts of issues around data. How do you read data? What does the data mean? How do I feed the data to other parts of the business? And I actually asked this question, I'm sorry, I'm gonna need glasses, but I actually asked this question to these pioneers around smart products, and you can see what they want to do with the data. Some of the ways in which they're going to do this is launch product categories that are new to the business, and they want to improve understanding of their customers. That's why they're making their products smart. It's about understanding your customers and delivering personalization, innovating product development. Data does that. And you can see what this data is being used for. You know, first and foremost, it's about making the cost of servicing a customer cheaper. It's about automating wherever possible. So you don't have to have call centers, you don't have to have agents, expensive agents, that can solve the customer's issue. Secondly, you really want to understand how your customers use products. How does your son brush his teeth? How well is your daughter brushing her hair? You know, you get these smart hair brushes that tell you how many times you should brush your hair. This is the world of smart products. They're starting to talk and tell us things. And for me, one of the most interesting things is how well you share data with suppliers to collaborate on product development. It's this world of connecting and sharing and co-creating with your customers, with your suppliers. So, some big changes on the horizon, and this is a rather scary slide for any product company because we are looking to create subscription-style services from the data. So there's some, some big business model changes on the horizon. If you're thinking a, a little bit ahead, so four or five years from now, what would I... Uh, what would I recommend to focus on? Well, I would say it's all about how well you can command data, how well you can read data. And not in a techie geeky way, but in a way that resonates around the business. Great data scientists are ones that can tell stories, not ones that can point to spreadsheets and graphs and say, this is what's happening. They're the ones that can tell stories around the data what it means to their company. So data mastery really means understanding how you take your data and blend it with other data. How you take weather data, perhaps, and fuse it with product data. What would that mean? Where are your products being used? When the weather's nice, like today? Or when the weather's pretty rubbish, like in London today? So it gives you an idea of, it's all about the data that you use and how well you can use the data. Now, this for me I think is critical because I think one of the, uh, the main issues you're going to see is this. Because more and more product companies, they want to use the data to interact directly with their customers for the first time. Now, that is a problem because 
your channel holds that relationship. So channel dynamics are starting to shift around product sales. Your channel is going to be pretty fed up if you start controlling the relationship with the end user rather than letting the channel feed what the user is saying to the, uh, the manufacturer. So you can see, for me, I think this is a, <coughs> this for me is critical because I, I think you're going to see some really interesting or really rather scary dynamics play out in the world of retail and direct retail because supermarkets are going to be so scared that they're going to lose the relationship with the customer that the customer can have a direct relationship with the manufacturer. That's just one to remember. So in an era of consortia, well, this is where you're starting to see the whole rise of the connected economy, the connected car, the connected home, the connected life. This is when products start combining with each other and forming really intricate chains from one end to another. And you can start to see that happen now around the home, around the car, around the power companies, for example. That connected economy, that connected product economy, is going to be something you'll see happen more and more in the future. So, what does this really mean? Well, I'm going to give you um, five clear takeaways uh, around the rise of smart products. And they're really for uh, business, actually. This is really a, a business game, not a technology game, not even a design game. This is about business and how business is going to change. So, I would recommend you pick an initiative. And what we found from our uh, research was there's three ways that companies are developing smart products. They're looking to innovate manufacturing processes. They're looking to develop innovative packaging around products that actually tell the user when a product has reached its sell-by date or safe to consume. And they also drive richer customer experiences. Those are the three ways companies are developing smart products. Manufacturing process improvement, a bit dull, but it's money. Enriched customer experiences, really interesting. And innovative, innovative packaging around food stuff and retail, I thought that was quite interesting. Number two, think about how you engage customers. Think about some of the techniques that companies are using to engage with customers like co-creation. In the Nordics in Sweden, we actually have a co-creation center that tries to think about how you use, uh, how you develop some of these co-creation platforms with your customers, but also with your suppliers and internally with your employees. The last thing you want to do is add features to a product that customers don't really want and just annoy them. And number three, develop an experimental mindset. Because um, <laughs> there are many ways that the data that your product generates can be used. And we have a, a maxim in Composite that talks about run better and run different. Run better is when you, you know, <coughs> try and you know, make things as efficiently as they can. Run different is when you try to do really new things, really innovative things. And this is where this belongs, because you're going to see change in the business model. I've given you some insights into how the business model will change. And you're going to start mixing the priority and third-party product data to develop and enrich customer experiences. The business will change. The traditional business model will change. It will shift from product sales to subscription-based. So that's a big change in terms of how a product work, works. And the focus really does shift from the physical product to the data that surrounds the product and how you can sell, marshal, move that data around the business. And really prime your company to partner. This is what I think is going to be critical over the next five years is how well one company can partner with another and how they can begin really joining together in those so-called ecosystems to satisfy customer demand. Because when you think about it, the possibilities really are endless. And I want to give you a finish with a very simple example from Copenhagen. How do I say this word? Booby. Has anyone heard of Booby? Yeah. Yeah. I love this. I think this is a great example 
of how a social enterprise that harnesses technology can really change, really change, you know, how we think about honey. So imagine if a honey jar became smart. Imagine if a honey jar could tell us about its contents. Because this is what I think Booby can actually do. Because what they've actually done is build up a really interesting honey map of Copenhagen. So depending on where you source your honey from, so in the uh, city hall, the honey is very uh, raspberry flavored because there's raspberry bushes around city hall. And you have Vesebro, Valvi, Amagar, you have these different flavors of honey because the bees feed in a very different way. Now imagine if the honey jar was small and could tell us that, and could tell us the flavor, could tell us the provenance, could tell us how that honey tastes, what it works with, what wine it works with. And this is where I think Boogie is going to go. And it's something I'd like to see happen in London as well. So the possibilities are endless. The possibilities from smart technologies are really endless. And it's just your imagination and your ability to partner that will limit how far this will actually go. So with that, I'd like to send you uh, the, the report once it's um, finished. I'll send it through to Vanessa, perhaps you can distribute. But the report is just about to be released, so the data looks a little bit rough. So my apologies, it's not beautifully designed, um, but um, it will be in about a couple of months. So, are there any questions before I... Actually, not what we're going to do, because part of this conference is um, getting to talk to other people and interact with other people. So first of all, big hand for you.